see or hear. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hey. <laughs> That's good. No, we're gonna... I'll say hello. I'm Juliet, and I came through. I'm a friend of Penny's. Penny Finn. I'm a friend of her. Oh, good. I know she's our new exhibit chair. She's jumping right in, which is terrific. Well, there's Rhea Nagel. We haven't heard from her for a bit. Cool. You know, it's we're reopening, so. Well, I'm already getting renewals, which is good. Did we get renewal notices? No, we didn't. It hasn't come out yet. Okay. But, if I don't um, get prompted, I'm like, yeah. I might as well be off in a the orbit. I think it's time for us to start. It's after 11. It's 24. Well, I was going to say too. So I, hello, I will start to share my screen. Oh. So can everyone see the screen? Yep. Yes. yes. We can mute ourselves. Really. Wonderful. Yes, I can see it. Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to the Collage Artists of America Behind the Artists event. My name is Lauren and I am CAA's current publicity chair. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us to celebrate World Collage Day. And I also wanted to let you all know that this event is being recorded for our friends who cannot attend live and it will be posted after the event and so I will um, start the recording now. Um, I, I will edit it. So last year was the first year CAA hosted the celebration and we're excited to have the opportunity to provide a space for artists to showcase their work again this year. Um, today's event will begin with an introduction of CAA by our wonderful newsletter editor, Quay Lin, followed by our speakers' presentations and we will have a short intermission um, before concluding with the second half of the speakers. And at the end, we will have time for any specific questions you may have for the speaker artists. Um, and we'll also have an uh, open forum for anyone else who would like to share with the little remaining time that we have. And I will be monitoring the chat as with help from Quay Lin. Um, so please put your questions there and try to remain on mute for the duration of the presentation. So we can hear everyone um, and yeah, let's get started. Um, I'm so looking forward to hearing all of your work. So I will pass it off to Quaylin. Hey, can you hear me? I hope so. Um, I'm uh, giving you a little bit of, of journey down memory lane and um, a little information about C what CAA has usually been doing these last 30 plus years. So we've got an organization that started in the late 1980s and uh, has been going ever since. And uh, it gives you a little bit of a hint here what we have. We have presentations, we have exhibits, we have um, actually general meetings with speakers. Um, and, and we used to have workshops and we're hoping to revive them um, when when there's a little bit more reopening or even have some Zooms because we've had Zoom, Zoom workshops headed by Barbara Mathis, who is here with us today. And uh, okay, next slide. Okay. Uh, one of the biggest things we do are exhibits. Lately, they've been online, but they've also been in galleries. And we're having actually an actual in-person one early in 2023. Um, at the Burbank, it's Betsy Luecki Burbank Creative Arts Center in Burbank. And so we're going to have that one. But meanwhile, we have um, online exhibits and we're going to have one this fall. We just don't have the details yet, except that it's going to be, um, uh, okay, I, do I remember the title? No, I'm sorry. But, but we are having one and, and we're working on it. And uh, hopefully everyone can join. And, and enter. Uh, we have meetings and programs. Right now, a lady named Jean Hess is a relatively new uh, board member, and she's in charge of that. And she's been getting us some really top-notch speakers. We've had some wonderful ones in the past, like Michael Church and Della Wells, 
you can see some of their work here. And this May 20th, Friday, May 20th, we are having Suzanne Strick, who is a very, very accomplished artist with a very long resume going out of Virginia. And she'll be talking to us. And that meeting is Friday, the 20th of May at 11 a.m. Pacific uh, Daylight Time. So I'm hoping that people can come join us. Um, we're, you know, we'll be sending like links to the meeting if you're a um, member. If you're not a member, then um, you'll need to contact somebody about, about possibly being able to join. I would contact probably Sylvia, our president. Um, and how to get hold of her is you go to our website, collageartists.org, and click on the newsletter um, tab, find an, any back issue of the newsletter, and then there's her email address. Okay, next. Uh, we give workshops. We're hoping to um, get some of those in the near future. Meanwhile, many of our newsletters have like workshop like things and activities for you that Barbara um, puts out and, and you can respond to by email. So that's kind of our stop gap measure. Scholarship, we, we do a scholarship every year and we give a thousand dollars to a deserving student. We got an excellent one this past year and um, that information is in the May newsletter uh, this year. Keiko Autumn Polk is from a couple of years ago and she was very impressive too. So we've, we've been getting some wonderful people from Cal State Northridge. Okay, next. Okay. Other things that we do at CAA is we have a Facebook page. Uh, the address is here on the screen, this Facebook address, or you just go on Facebook and you type in Collage Artists of America and we're the very big group with over 10,000 members. Maybe it's even 12,000 now, but it's growing. It's a huge membership and um, it's a very thriving venue for looking at new art and also getting tips and tricks about collage. So we have a website. That's another big one. It gives like updates on what we've been doing. Um, and that's at www.collageartists.org. And then the newsletter, that's my baby. I'm the newsletter editor. And um, we put it out about once a month. Um, and it has like recaps of our activities, members work. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually an exhibit venue for you. Um, if you're a member of Collage Artists, I'm very happy to put your work in the newsletter. And then in a way it's like published because this newsletter hangs around and is archived on our website and and you can like click on it and uh and then you can get access to the newsletters and your work so the deadline is the second of every month i'm pretty strict about that and if, if you don't make it we can just put it to the next month so any submissions of news um submit to be by the second of each month uh july i'm taking a kind of a break from the newsletter but that's the only exception and and so, okay, so that's the newsletter. And uh, next slide. Okay, here's um, how you can become a member of Collage Artists. I know there's one lady who said that she wanted to. And if you go on www.collageartists.org and hit the Join Renew tab, you'll be able to like um, uh, get to be a new member. And, and we've recruited quite a lot of people over the last couple of years during the pandemic and we're happy to recruit more. Um, the membership chair is also here with us today. Her name is Suzanne Belcher and she's wonderful. She said she will um, give you like personalized attention and make you um, want to be in our fold. So I, I, um, you will look forward to hearing from her. I'm not sure if there's another, is there another slide? I think there is. I'm trying to be brief. Ah, join the board. We at the board have um, worked very hard and we all feel that we have gained more than we have given. And if you are in any way interested in joining us, um, we need helpers, we need 
sometimes we need committee chairs, although I think we're doing a little better with that. But anytime anyone wants to help or has any specific interest or skill, we're very glad to hear from you. The other thing, and I've got to, I've got to like um, promote this, is we are currently having elections at CAA. If you're a member, um, please, please vote. Um, we are trying to get a quorum for the election. So we've extended the deadline so that we can get people to vote. Um, there, was, uh, there were two emails sent with the ballot. Um, and what we need is for you to go back into the emails. And um, actually there's, there, okay, there were two. And you can go into those emails and vote by forwarding the message and typing in the return address and marking the blocks and sending. There will be another um, email sent on Monday with the ballot. And I'm hoping that you can please respond if you are having trouble finding the ballot. I appreciate your, your listening to me about this issue, but I'm on the um, election committee and I'm like, I'm like, you know, we're all kind of in pins and needles a little bit. So we want to make sure we get quorum. Thank you, it's a plea. Um, and, and of course, anyone who wants to join the board, uh, we have a re really nice group of people right now. It's great. Um, I think that's my last one, so I'm done. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Craven. Um, and now I will um, share the speakers. So this is the order of the speakers for this year. And if um, once it's once you see your image on the screen, if you could unmute and share, that would be wonderful. So I'm excited that Lucy, you will take us off. Okay, so that's not the image that I thought I was going to see, but I'm glad to talk about it. Um, almost all of my uh, mixed media collages have met are, are really the same. They have the same kind of perspective and the same kind of techniques. So today I wanted to just mention a couple of things to you that I'll get to in a minute about how I might be, for most of us, uh, the canary in the mine about copyright issues. Because as you see, <laughs> What I often do is the extreme of appropriation for, for collage artists in some ways, because what my intention is, my intention is to find, and I do a lot of research to find uh, images of often places, scenes, even whole rooms, where I see that there is a cultural uh, stereotype there that could be just accepted uh, without any kind of investigation. And I subvert it by adding appropriate, you know, get other images. I either um, either draw them or I uh, find other images, often from uh, vernacular snapshots. So most of us uh, do something that is less referential to something like a scene. So I'm very interested in copyright uh, because I think that I I do have. Um, a process that could be questioned for appropriation. So I just want to mention a little bit to everybody about that. You probably may be more expert than I am, but I do uh, still depend on the College Art Association's uh, very lengthy, very detailed, and I think very thorough uh, discussion of fair use and copyright from 2015 that's on their site. Um, I also periodically consult people from uh, lawyers from the arts. And as you know, there's one in just about every state. California has a very active lawyers for the arts. But what you sometimes get from that can be misleading because they're attorneys and they're used to arguing a case. And they may in fact argue a case from perspective that might not be universal. And so right now, I think uh, fair use is sort of up for uh, possibly changing quite a bit. You may know that uh, Richard Prince is the bad boy of appropriation, and his roller coaster of lawsuits uh, has resulted in all kinds of differing opinions legally. And now we have one 
a big case that will be taken, as you probably know, by the Supreme Court in June 2023. And that's the case where uh, Lynn Goldsmith, a photographer, is being sued by the uh, Warhol Foundation because they, without asking her, used her photograph of prints to create um, the Annie Wall had used her photograph without her permission to create prints and they now sell them and own them and uh, deal with them and she sued them and she won an opinion and now they're taking it to the Supreme Court. So the issue there as you know is, or you may not know this, that one thing that's always I think I felt my protection is transformation of whatever you appropriated. Is your work um, transformative? when you look at it compared to your original work. And I think my works are transformative and I have, you know, some critical things, critical, um, just critics have said, well, that's transformative, which is helpful. But that may not be anymore what the Supreme Court uses. It's just hard to know. Um, there in California, the lawyers for the arts, you may know, they're having a, 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 a whole, a discussion of and a training in copyright, but it's going to be focused on music, but you might be able to find someone there who is an expert more on visual arts, but beware, they may have an opinion that they think is absolutely right, but it's likely not to be universally accepted because nothing is right now about copyright. So that's what I say. So this work to me uh, does the things that I do with lots of my pieces. It's a, it is the back it's the backyard of somebody that I found in an old architecture book from the 50s and uh, I added some um, I added some of the detail to the, the wall that was by the swimming pool and then I added a, a person to this is a little dangerous the woman who is dressed as a, in sort of an, a costume that might be a Perot sort of costume um, she's from a furniture ad, so I guess they could come after me. And then we have a Calder uh, sculpture in the left that's turned into a bird, and Wu from the Hollywood sign, um, and then some other things. So it, it, what I intended by this was to have a scene that had viewers think about how do women get to a place to practice the arts, and what do they face? and what draws them to do it, even if they face things that are hard. So uh, lots of my work has that kind of a scene that you might say, well, yeah, that's a swimming pool, it has a wall. Uh, it's odd that it seems like it'd be out nowhere, but maybe. And then uh, I put in surreal elements so it doesn't become didactic with me telling you what to think about it. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody have any questions and doesn't want to turn me in to anybody for appropriation? <laughs> and we, I'm sure there'll be questions and we, if, if it's okay with everyone, we'll, we'll save them for the end. But I, I thank you very much, Lucy. Esther, it is your turn. Hi, I'm Esther Perlman. And uh, as you can see, and I always loved art. And uh, junior high school, I started loving art, and um, and then uh, uh, my husband didn't want me to major in art because he said, "Oh, you're never going to make any money." But he told me not to say that. But I'm only saying. It. <laughs> so, so I majored in radio, TV, film, and then, but some of my favorite artists were Van Gogh, Gauguin, Picasso, when Renoir, and I, Andy Warhol's. We just talked about Andy Warhol's. Anyway, I use watercolor, oils, acrylics. And for the past five years, I've been using a wonderful product called washi tapes. It is fun and it doesn't hurt my eyes. I used to wake up in the middle of the night painting on canvases and then I get paint all over the house. So my husband said, oh, move your painting. And I moved it to a studio. So I have like 20 years of paintings in the studio now. So I've been doing my artwork again in the house because I haven't been going out that much. So those washi tapes are great because you can be watching TV or listening to TV and then doing the washi tapes. So what I do is I use a Sharpie pen and then I have these different kinds of papers and washi tapes and I stick them on uh, the paper or canvas and then um, 
I have books and books of uh, washi tape pictures. <laughs> and so, um, in fact, my whole house has got all this art all over the place. And uh, I probably need another storage place to hide, put my, hide my art or put it away or something. And then what I've done with the washi tapes, I've also created 11 books. And each, each, each book has some art in there. So that's one way to get rid of some of the art. <laughs> no. And so uh, some of the books that I have created is called A Face is a Face is a Face. And so what it is, is like pictures of art. And then it has a little statement and the children are supposed to answer the questions and talk about the picture. And this is my newest book called Looking for the Bright Side, mostly because that you know, last two years, everybody's been looking for the bright side. And so I put my art, these are the tapes that I'm, I created this big piece of art. And then I almost sold it, but I didn't, because I didn't put the price tag on it. Didn't. Anyway, <laughs> not a very good business person, unfortunately. If I could just uh, become a better business person, I, I'm sure I would be better. So, so anyway, it has stories of my life and my husband and and uh, you know how he's objectionable, objectionable to my, some of my ideas, and we, <laughs> so I'm sure everybody has this this problem. You live with someone, they always have a different opinion, and so. And then when I had my 80th birthday, my daughter made this collage for me, and that was real cool. And then I had speakers, and I had uh, my grandson played uh, guitar and sang. And then, um, so this is sometimes how I feel. <laughs> so, you know, so it's fun to do art that makes people laugh. And I, that's one of the pleasures I get from doing my art. Thank you very much. Yester. Suzanne. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Suzanne Belcher. And I'm the membership chair for Collage Artists of America. And today I'm very happy to uh, share a recent collage with you today. But before I do that, Hi, I want to, I want to, uh, really? I'm so sorry. Uh, Can I call Barbara? you back? I'm, I'm watching. Um, oh, <laughs> oh, wait. So I'm sorry. You Suzanne, need to, I'm sorry. You need to mute yourself. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, sweetheart. I am. It's okay. Sometimes I'm only in eighth grade. Okay. <laughs> I try. There we go. There we go. So before I get started, I want to give a really big shout out to, to Lauren. She has put together uh, with help from Quailene and uh, a couple of other people. Um, this World Collage Day. It's a lot of work. And she's doing this in the middle of finals. And she just graduated from Loyola University. We're so proud of her. And uh, soon she takes off for Michigan, where she lives. And then maybe she'll be traveling uh, to Europe to get her master's degree. So we're really proud of this lady. And uh, Quailene and everyone who helped put this together. So anyway, what we're seeing today is uh, reflections of Olvera Street past. It occurred to me this morning, since one of my art pieces is in the World Collage Day logo, I should have selected that one, but uh, this one is okay. So this piece was done for a uh, 100th year anniversary exhibition uh, that Women Painters West installed in Glendale's Historic Brand Library Art Gallery. Each member of the organization was asked to choose a work that inspired them from a list that we were given of late WPW artists. And I chose a painting by Vera Staples that was called Olvera Street, El Pueblo de Los Angeles, circa 1935. So during the first COVID lockdown, since I mostly the last several years uh, have not done very much cut and paste collage. Um, I 
sort of reinvented myself and I do a lot of digital photo collage, taking my own pictures and photographs and uh, make, making prints of them. So this was uh, getting back to uh, cut and paste actually. So anyway, we drove downtown and during lockdown, during COVID and everything was closed down at that time. So I did take I actually got out of the car, walked around, took some photographs of uh, the old Olvera Street and uh, buildings downtown Los Angeles. And that's what I was originally going to submit to, uh, to this ex exhibition, but I did not do it. I decided to create uh, a collage uh, cut and paste collage. And uh, you can see that uh, in front of you. But the digital collage that uh, I did is you can't see it clearly, but it is in the upper left interior of the gallery. And I've lost my place. I'm reading and I'm like, where am I? So I I decided to uh, cut out a lot of the uh, printed elements of Staples painting. And I collaged it in the windows of a ground that I had photographed in Massachusetts of a retrospective I went to, Solowet ret Retrospective. And I have used many of those photographs as grounds in a lot of my collages. So I took that photograph and I collaged into it. So Vera's painting is in the windows. And uh, then I collaged uh, the reflections of those pieces in, in the ground area. And I incorporated uh, some of my, sign my signature of image of my own shadow image. Um, I, I will refer to some of the things that Lucy said um, about um, copyright issues and uh, included some, um, I guess it was pen and ink and some watercolor and some colored pencils in the work. So rather than submitting the little collage I did, I wanted a larger impression. So I decided to photograph it and I had it printed on canvas uh, for the exhibit to make a little larger impact. Um, so that is, that's the etiology of this piece. But I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Lucy's copyright issues. We recently had, uh, Collage Artists of America had uh, an exhibit, a Zoom exhibit, online reception called Mixed Metaphors. And the piece that I chose to talk about was called Thoughts Become Things. And it was a large digital photo collage that I had done. And I was so excited as a, you know, going downtown Los Angeles, it's an artist's dream, the photographer's dream to just photograph everything. And on six uh, street, there is this incredible mural on a building Hi. called Our Lady of Downtown Los Angeles. And I had gone to a reception downtown and it was in the evening and I just started taking uh, photographs everywhere. And I photographed this mural, came out really well and uh, took photos inside, when, you know, re re reflections in windows. And I put this collage together called Thoughts Become Things. I exhibited this work in a uh, show that uh, was held by Lark Gallery. And one of the muralist friends came to see the show. And I had two pieces using that image of the mural. And he called the artist who called the... Um, exhibit chair and said, 
take that work down immediately. That is my work. So my husband's an attorney and he said, I told you, you could have copyright issues. But as a photographer, you're downtown, it's public work. It's, you can take pictures of, of people. You do not, you know, they're, they're in the public. You can take pictures of them and there's no repercussion. Well, I was mortified. So I had not given any credit to him. I didn't really know who he was until this came about. So I had to do some research. And so I gave him credit on everything that's on my website. Uh, I have uh, been reluctant to, to show the piece again, but I did submit it for this mixed metaphor show. And it was, uh, I talked about it as a cautionary tale. So I would encourage everyone here today to go on our website and click on the reception for mixed metaphors. Bob Burridge was the juror, and he made a statement uh, that um, he said, it's always an issue, you know, however, if you have done the work, like Lucy, you know, did her own elements in there to uh, transform the work, it's your work, he said, it's your work after you die. Uh, it's, he didn't feel that, uh, anything is a copyright issue really unless that you're copying it exactly so as long as you uh alter the work um but you, you have to be careful so i just wanted to make a comment on that uh to do some research guys and uh go and look at our our reception and uh, what bob burridge said about that because it's important so thank you so much and I uh, look forward to hearing uh, others speak. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Yes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I feel I'm pretty new in the space. Um, I started colleges during COVID at the beginning and I just kept going. I think I've done some collages when I was a kid, but uh, never pursued. Um, and what I really care about is the environment. And um, I was a, I, I'm French. I grew up in the countryside of Brittany um, in the lands of Krebs and then moved to Paris and studied chemistry and uh, social and political sciences at Sciences Po. Um, and then I moved to Los Angeles where I'm based right now. Um, and it feels like, I think I'm not the only one here in LA. So it's, it's cool. Maybe we'll meet in person. Um, and I came as a diplomat with the Embassy of France to work uh, with the Office for Science and Technology. So as a science diplomat, uh, working to foster collaborations between France and the US and I would always um, have a point of view on uh, sustainability and uh, resilience um, in different aspects. Um, so when I picked up collages, uh, it was like a meditative practice um, during COVID as I spent a lot of time by myself. And yeah, one of my inspiration is um, the elements and the forests, the trees, the rivers. So I try to like find magazines and books where I can find those uh, patterns and images. And my other inspiration is movement because I've been in movement my entire life and I love moving, I love dancing. And right now, since my position at the embassy ended in November, I am transitioning to stay here in LA for longer. And um, I, pole danced for the past eight years. So I'm a pole dancer and I'm trying to bridge also pole dance and sustainability. And I'm doing this as well with collages. Um, and this is why I entitled um, this collage, The Fate of the Rivers is the Fate of All People. Um, and I like how this is one of the, my favorite collages where this dancer woman her arm just transformed it into this river 
that's uh, irrigating um, a fire, a wildfire that's just right under in the same color palette. Um, so I'm often going towards um, patterns and color palettes that are very earthy, as well as um, just connecting movements and and earth elements. Um, yeah, and I exhibited for the first time as I live in LA at the Very Artist Loft. Um, if you know, it's this giant artist complex with maybe over 150 lofts, uh, only with artists. And twice a year, there is an art walk, so the Brewery Art Walk. And we open our loft, and this was the first time since COVID happened, um, since I moved here. And we transformed the, the loft into a gallery. And so I was able to actually showcase for the first time and share with the public um, and sell some of them, which was very rewarding and getting photos from people that are putting them on their walls and friends and family. Um, so yeah, it's a, a journey that is starting for me and I'm really excited to meet you all. And I'm sharing everything on my Instagram for now uh, that I just created pretty recently. So I will share the info in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Lucy, another Lucy. Hey, everybody. Uh, Let's see. Uh, I am delighted to be here. I'm delighted to have seen uh, some of your work. Uh, I haven't seen everybody's work that's here, but what I've seen I've just really loved and it's been inspiring. So it's great to be part of this group. Uh, during 2020, uh, during lockdown, I was obsessed with doing paintings that were sized 20 inches by 20 inches. For some reason, as we moved into 2021, my world felt even more restricted. So I went to eight inches by eight inches and I decided to try something that I hadn't quite known before, done before in, in such quantity. And I did little wood panels. Now I have 17 of these little wood panels, eight by eight inches with collage fabric, acrylic and paper. Uh, these here are mainly acrylic uh, fabric mesh hard that I got at the hardware store, fabric remnants, and uh, paper, hard paper. Uh, what I felt as I was doing these, oh, first of all, I wanted to let you guys know, I don't know how many of you may know about it, but I subscribe to the Textile Arts LA newsletter. And very often they have interesting workshops and things to, to see. But one of my favorite things is every once in a while they have a fabric exchange and everybody takes their leftover fabrics and goes to the Helms building in Culver City. And there is a big table there and everybody dumps their fabrics down and you just take what you want or take what appeals to you and somebody else takes something else. It's a, it's a fabulous exchange, not only of the fabrics themselves, but also the exchange of ideas with other textile artists. So this is really fun. Uh, but I must say that mainly I was, I've been doing acrylics and made and collages with paper. And I got into fabrics after taking a workshop with my colleague, uh, Eliza Day Green, and she got me into this fabric mode and I just love it. Uh, I love combining these pieces because I work in a very different way from the way I work on my paintings. On my paintings, I start with some kind of a plan. That doesn't mean I'll stick to the plan. 90% of the time I don't, but I do start with a plan. Whereas with these, I start with the fabrics and then they lead me to create to the colors and then they lead me to the shapes. And so it's a different way of working, kind of like solving a puzzle and you never know where it's going to take you. So it's exciting, challenging, but you do have to work with these little bitty pieces and it's getting hard for my hands. The other thing I did in these two pieces that I had not done before in the other wood panels is work on both of them at the same time. And I think you can clearly see the connection here. Uh, the hardware 
mesh, uh, hardware store mesh that I bought, I dunked into acrylic paint, but I found in some pieces, it, it, in the piece on the left, it adhe the paint adhered more. Uh, so I knew I could go for a look that had something behind something else. And this was something I had not done in the other pieces up to that point of having depth. And this was kind of an exciting way to provide depth by having some fabric pieces below, some fabric pieces above the mesh. Uh, I used fabric medium and the Liquitex fabric medium to adhere the fabrics uh, and to coat the fabrics when I when I want to it before I before adhering them. And I also use the GAC 900, but then you need to iron the fabrics before you adhere them. So this was giving me a whole bunch of new ideas and new way of working that I hadn't done. So even though my world was restricted now to eight inch by eight inch, it really opened up a whole bunch of other techniques. So, uh, and, and working two at a time is one of the things I think I will try again with my bigger acrylic paintings. I think they, they speak to each other. As you can see here, the open shapes on the right were really cut out from the shapes on the left. That's what's left over and painted in a different color. Um, so it, to me, it was like putting little puzzle pieces together. And as they grew, I started to see that one suggested nighttime and the other one suggested the enthusiasm of starting on your day, or at least to me it did. Uh, I don't know if it does to you because I always suggest something else to different viewers. So I think this is, um, this kind of sums up this practice. I, I feel like I wanna continue doing this. It's a great interlude between working on 36 by 36 acrylics, which is usually the size I paint in. And I do much more geometric uh, uh, work on the acrylics and, and not as much collage on the big pieces. So this allows me the freedom to experiment with that. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy them. Thank you for sharing again, this year, Lucy. Uh, the chat is, um, lots of fun in the chat happening. Um, so I would like to um, first thank, thank you, Suzanne, for the, the little shout out. And, but thank you to all of you that are here today. And CAA has just been such a special, absolutely such a special group for me. So um, I just, I wanted to, to say that. Um, briefly before I read Mike. So we have a new member, CA, um, new CAA member, Mike, um, who could not be here today. So I will be reading a prepared statement um, that he created to share with all of you. So this is his work. You are now free to move about the cabin. His foray into collage began when he was 19 years old. He had dropped out of college and was searching for a creative outlet. He initially tried his hand at painting, buying canvas, brushes, and oil paints, and diving into it with no idea of what he was doing. One day, while waiting for paint to dry on a very disappointing piece, he decided to take some magazines and make a collage. He quickly found it to be much more satisfying than anything he had been able to do with paints. It wasn't long before the paint supplies made their way to a friend and he began amassing an enormous collection of magazines, glue sticks, and X-Acto knives. He spent the next eight years exploring many different techniques. He learned through trial and error about what glues worked better than others, varnishing and sealing techniques, and was forever on the quest for more and more magazines for material to work with. He showed his work at a few coffee shops and twice at the library in his hometown, but this was all before the internet had really developed to anything even close to what it is like today. At that point, downloading a picture took as long as 45 minutes, which by the way, still left him awestruck that he could actually get the image from one of his favorite band's album covers through the computer, regardless of how long it took. His only way to share his work was with his friends, and community was to pile his finished pieces into a portable art case his sister had bought him and take it to them. 
Eventually, his life and living arrangements necessitated him abandoning his huge collection of magazines, and he went through about a 10-year period that he did no artwork at all. Then came along digital. Digital cameras became more and more affordable, and Photoshop became more and more user-friendly. He gradually learned the basics of photography and editing digital photos. While it was exciting to have a new avenue to be creative again, his heart still longed to do something more like collage. He had a friend that was more advanced than he was at Photoshop that could answer many of his questions. One day, Mike asked him, how can I take elements from a picture and turn them into pieces that I could then set into another picture? He replied, oh, just turn it into a layer. That was what I needed, the Photoshop magic of layers. Just like that, I was back in love with collage, creating at breakneck pace, this time with a myriad of possibilities to manipulate and duplicate the images he was working with. He does miss his glue sticks and the hours spent pouring over magazines, but digital has become his new playground. This piece that was selected today for this presentation is entitled you are now free to move about the cabin. And this is the fourth piece in a series that was inspired by the recent passing of his father. I found he found himself focused, creatively speaking, on capturing a surreal introspective into his own feelings about life and death, the journey we all make as we come forth out of the womb and eventually fade back into the unknown. As with all of his pieces, he does not intend for there to be a single set interpretation. Rather, he tries to create an undercurrent of symbolism that propels the viewer's thoughts along in a general direction, yet leaves them free to arrive at different conclusions or no conclusion at all. So this is the statement that Mike has prepared and thank you, Mike, for deciding to join us as a speaker. If anyone has any questions or comments about his piece, please feel free to include them in the chat and I will make sure he receives, receives them in addition to this recording. So now we will have a very short few minute intermission so everyone can grab a bite to eat, a, more coffee or tea and um, I will stay here and we'll all reconvene in a few minutes. So thank you. Lauren, is the pinning of the screen working out okay? This is Quay Lynn. I'm just wondering if the pinning of the screen works out okay. I, I'm having a, a good time of it, but I wasn't sure if it was working. Is it working for, for everyone? Have you been able to? Is there anyone else that? It, it works fine. Able to? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay, it's good. And Esther? When it looks she really good. Books. Yeah. Did you say my name? Oh, yes. I said that I was pinning you when you were showing your books on the screen. You want me to show it to you again? Oh, no. No, I. we were just talking about pinning. I I'll mean, pin. you can if you want to, but. <laughs> I don't know if I can. Can, oh. you see, can you see me? I can pin you. Really, I can see you, but I don't see myself. Okay. Okay, well, so this was one of the books that I did, uh, which was with the washi tapes and the um, ink. And, but see what, somebody asked me about my publisher. Some of these publishers, this guy that did my, this book, uh, he did it himself. I gave him my pictures and my uh, words and he put it all together. And um, so he doesn't, even have a publishing, I guess he has his own publishing company, but if you're interested in his name, Pablo, uh, what's his name? <laughs> this is about four years ago, this book. Um, it was a very famous name, sorry. Uh, can't find it. Oh, Capro, I think he's a, a, probably the son of a famous Capro person, you know, the, a, a director, Capro. Anyway. Frank, uh, like Frank Capra, you mean? Yeah, Frank, maybe that might be his father, oh. but he didn't tell me it was, but maybe. 
okay. Uh, but his name is Pablo uh, Papra, and he he put together this book. All I did was I took the pictures. Um, I, I gave them, you know, the, on one of those uh, metal things that you you get from um, your computer or from. Uh, I got it from uh, like uh, CBS. They have their own uh, photograph where you could take your pictures and, and have them relayed. And so I gave him the pictures and he put it on his computer and he contacted the, the people and put that book together. This has been a beautiful, you know, a beautiful book. Look at how clear the pictures are. Aren't they great? I have, that book. I have huh? that book yesterday. It's wonderful. This is Barbara. I have, I have that book and I love it. Wow! Yeah. Good for you. Wow! Nice. Thank you. Yeah. You're so welcome. you know, you even autographed it. <laughs> I went, huh? <laughs> you autographed it. It was wonderful. Thank oh, you. well, that's good. Too bad I can't remember anything. Well, that's I why artists so great. You can do it on your on a piece of paper, and it's there. <laughs> but um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I went to the book fair uh, a couple weeks ago, and then I brought my books and I uh, stayed there for two hours. And what else did I do? So, I have a few of your books, Esther, and they're yes, all so much, I know. They're well, all I, so much can fun. You, can and, you uh, believe? Like they, I have eleven books, and and then uh, <laughs> so all you could do is just you know you could put your art. Why don't you put all your art in a book too? Wouldn't that be a nice big, nice big book? Put your favorite people in there, Susan. Yeah, well, yours are more uh, storytelling. No, uh, but I have work in several books, actually, but they're sort of vanity books. Who would buy them? You know, except the, uh, the artists. Well, that you have your book signing. And you have your book signings, and then you have your book show, your uh, art shows, and then they'll be just sitting there waiting well, for everybody to, to buy one. Well, I have one book that I that I published with a co-author called Looking for 527. Um, I am an environmental type person as well. And this was uh, related to the Yellowstone wolves back in 2009. Oh, yes, the wolf. That, um, oh, that is beautiful. It was killed in the first Montana wolf, uh, wolf hunt. And it really touched me. So I found someone who had the collar of 527 and she's a nature essayist and oh, had followed true. the wolf for years so I reached out to her she lives in Texas we have never met and we're still connected after all of these years and I used her essay looking for 527 and some of her uh, current husband's photographs as well with my own collages and we put this book together and then it was through create space which never uh, which does not exist anymore and it really screwed things up because we had a platform where all of the um, residuals for the book were sent directly to Yellowstone Park Foundation mm -hmm. it was not a money-making proposition for us and all of the books that I've sold personally um, go into a special account and all of the proceeds are donated to environmental uh, organizations. So it was just a, a passion. Oh, I think that's project. wonderful. You have a project that you created that's, you know, so helpful and, and uh, that's very wonderful. I just have a project. I just like doing it. <laughs> that's my well, project. <laughs> Well, yours are so fun and you know oh, with you. the ones you've done with children are great i think we're starting again oh thank you i don't mean to interrupt i want to make oh. sure everyone i love oh, listening okay. to this conversation thank you i um i would love to hear more about that after quaylin are you i think we should begin again i want to be conscious of everyone's time today thank you yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't, I don't. Okay, well, I'm speaking and I guess I should be pinned, but somehow I'm not, at least not in my screen. So let's see. Huh. We can see know. you. 
You can see me? Oh, okay, I can see you. Maybe I just can't see myself. Okay, that's okay. Um, <laughs> just so long that people, you know, know that it's me. <laughs> okay, my name is Quaylin Lum. I'm a newsletter editor. And the um, picture at the left is what I'm talking about. It's called All the Strangers. And um, this is a pandemic piece from early in the pandemic. And um, early in the pandemic, you know, we were all sequestered and we ventured out with grave caution. And I took a look around our neighborhood. It was kind of a big deal to walk around. And um, I saw this heavy wood fence that I wanted to become a background texture. So I photographed it. And uh, I saw on it images of people who were strangers. I just kind of was looking at the fence and for some reason I had a vi vi vision and I really don't do that very often. Um, and uh, they were strangers to each other. They were incomprehensible to each other. And they were strangers to our new way of life. Many of us were outright aliens. And the vision must have reflected how I felt about our situation in a COVID world and about the social societal divisions that had been erupting for many years. And uh, so to make this piece, I went into my archive of cut paper figures. For a while, for maybe a couple of years, I took pieces of paper and I folded them and I cut and I got human figures. And sometimes I didn't fold them, I just cut and I got figures, not, no, not necessarily human, but human-ish. And sometimes I drew a little guidelines and then I cut and I had figures. And um, I noticed the piece on the right, it isn't actually a detail of this piece um, on the left, but it is a similar kind of a thing. And the piece on the right was, um, it was a whole different piece. It was kind of, I think it, it was, it was a uh, march and that one was done like cut and paste, the one on the right was. The one on the left, however, was digital. And um, what happened was I had all this archive of these cut figures and I got you know, to photograph them and then I digitized them by tracing. And I use a program called Corel Draw 7 and it traces, it can trace figures and you can get very close to a, a duplicate of the, certainly the silhouette of what you were working with before. And um, so some were, you know, actually some of the pieces on the right um, made it onto the piece on the left. You can see where this large red figure of a man turning sideways mm -hmm. the, near, near the bottom of the piece on the left is the same one as that brown figure kind of nearish right middle from the one on the right. And uh, so I just, you know, I traced it and then he made his way onto the piece on the left. And so I grabbed photos of some of my other artwork, like the one on the right, which had individual flat hand-drawn elements. I took photos and digitally traced them. So I have a whole lot of images at my disposal. And uh, I've been using this vector illustration program called Corel Draw since 1996. And it's not like Photoshop, it's different. It uses um, Bezier curves and other uh, like ways to make shapes and you can trace the shapes, you can make them yourself. You can do you know, lots of different things with them. And I happen to like it much better than Photoshop. And it's a little much closer to Adobe Illustrator I just don't happen to use Adobe Illustrator. Um, someone asked how long it took me to paste and cut it and put it together. Not, not very long, maybe a week. You know, I mean, to put it together was fast. It was maybe it could be done in a day. It's just that you have to arrange and you have to arrange it the way you want. And that's part of the trick too. So basically I, I collaged these figures digitally onto a photo of the fence. And they were arranged in long wide sequences like ancient Egyptian murals. I love ancient Egyptian murals and I love the flat imagery and, and it, because you, in a way it almost looks like a text. And so I like that. Um, and, uh, and so that's what happened here. Um, and, uh, and then I just, you know, just, it, it, it just feels like a text. So in this piece on the left, there are many scenarios at the top right, there's people re 
like kind of railing against the world. And in the second row from the top, there are encapsulated people and a red one who is discarded and lies horizontally. The third row from the top is a confrontation between a yellow masked crowd um, and the blue masked crowd. Fourth row, there are barriers between people imposed by masks and eye shades. So here the masks are starting to make, starting to make their way into the piece. Uh, the bottom two rows have many alien forms who are barely of this world. And on two sides of the place of the piece are shapes that are spaced equally apart. And they are a reference to the six feet social distancing that we observed or didn't observe when we had mm -hmm. to line up. Uh, someone's asking how big it is. Okay, the piece on the left is digital, so it can be sized up to any size or size down. It's kind of like, um, uh, okay, we had a speaker at CAA who was just saying when she had di digital pieces, she really didn't put a size because they're scalable. And when you work in Corel Draw, they're really scalable. It's, it's like you can make them really big or really small. And um, I'm, I'm Judy Sissons, that was the lady who, who said that. Um, the piece on the right, which was a, like kind of a predecess, pre, pre, uh, predecessor, what's the word for it? The, anyway, it, it preceded the one on the left. That one was actually cut and paste and is about 12 inches high by um, I'd say 36 wide. So it was long and wide. I just love long and wide pieces. So, um, you know, but you can, you know, once you trace any of the elements from, from the piece on the right, you can make them big or small, depending on what you want when you use it in a program like Corel Draw. So, um, yeah, so let's see. Yeah, so that, that's the basic explanation of All the Strangers, which is the piece on the left. And um, we were talking a lot about books. So I, I'm gonna, I don't know if anyone can see this. Can anyone see this thing that I'm holding up? Because I can't see myself on the screen. No. no. Put it up more in front of your face, Pauline. Okay, can you see this? Yeah. Okay, it's a book. Um, no. We were talking no, about- No, that's your background. That, yeah, I only correct. see background. I will um, get rid of the background. It's a mess, but that, I, I don't really care very much. Let's <laughs> see. Um, I'm just gonna put, no, I don't want it anymore. Let's see, where do I do that? Sorry, we were talking about books. So there goes my French landscape. Um, okay, <laughs> this here, this is a book too. And yeah, you know, we were talking about books. I've made a book and it's got my drawings in it. This is after all the strangers and I went and did a whole bunch of digital cartoons and they're sequential and I made a book and there's a couple more coming soon. And it's, it's Esther Perlman was my inspiration. She could make a book, I was gonna make a book, you know? And um, it, it's, and, and so, but my publisher was different. My publisher is Kindle Direct Publishing. It might be the replacement for Create Space. And frankly, what I really like about it is that the startup fee is zero. I mean, zero. If you have the skills, and I, have a, I happen to have the skill to make um, like a sequence of pages that can be published in PDF format. And it's basically, I guess I, I did what, what Esther's um, person um, who compiled her book did. I did it on my own because I do the newsletter and I have you know, similar kinds of skills, even if I use different software to do it. And, and so you get this PDF format thing, very much like the newsletter, really, very, very much. And then you load it into um, Kindle Direct Publishing and you load a cover and, and then you press, press like publish this work and then it will go on Amazon. I mean, it's something that my husband did because he's a writer and he self-publishes books and, and he did it and so he held my hand while I did the process, but actually it's very self-explanatory and they have people there to guide you along. And, and so that's another possibility for self-publishing. And this, these books, they're vanity projects. I'm just, you know, flat out pandemic project. I decided to 
publish them because they aren't they didn't really have any other way to be distributed so that's my story on books okay i can turn to the next person thank you Carlin. Beth, hello I'm here. hi how's everybody hi um since i saw you all last year we've moved to houston from the georgia mountains so um trying to get my studio together again and become productive again and all those things that you know go into creating your work this piece is um it's the one that's actually behind me so you can see for scale it's two by three feet and um it was a painting and with the move halfway across the country you know, you really decide what you're going to keep, the number of books I got rid of, how much artwork I donated to, well, donated, gave to um, charity <laughs> resale shops and everything. But this was one that I really wanted to keep. Part of it was because I really liked the canvas. <laughs> but so um, when we were living up in the mountains during COVID time, I was doing botanical prints um, using jelly plates and rice paper and acrylic paint. And um, so I had a big stack of my botanical prints and just kind of re-sketched on the canvas that I had gessoed over and decided to do a real simplified still life. I just needed something that was calming and soothing and fun at the same time. So almost every single thing that you see on this image um, is torn or cut paper from the botanical prints that I had printed myself. I have such a fear of copyright infringement. Um, I had been a graphic designer, did some children's illustration, and I just have such a fear of that that I decided I would um, collage color instead of images. So <clears throat> that's what this is. And then I added the whimsical birds to kind of lighten up this kind of a mid-century looking still life. So, um, and then as I mentioned, the white is gesso. I love the flatness of it. It really just, erases so much so quickly. Um, and then there were some places you could see at the top where I just kind of scratched over the existing paint. So it was, um, so you could see there was a shadow of that. So it wasn't totally flat on the top. But this is called, well, Tweeting Still Life. And I think one of my favorite pieces in art history was a Twittering machine. So this is kind of, y'all probably all remember that piece. So um, this is it, but thank you, Lauren, again, for putting this together and um, congratulations and good luck on your the next phase of your life. And um, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Beth. I'm so happy that you could join us again this year. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm so happy that all of you can be here to speak and there are Four speakers after me. I, I never really know where to put. I I, I don't know, but this is my piece, Bunten Dry Zwei, um, or um, Variegation in the Triangle 2 in English. So I recently graduated with a major in art history, and Wisely Kandinsky is an artist I've always thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and this piece was inspired by his, of course, original Bunt und Dreieck, um, which was painted in 1927. And I actually have it behind me on my wall as like a little acrylic print um, because I, it's one of my favorite pieces. So this collage was, uh, I, I originally made this collage as a gift for my cousin um, two years ago. So I created it with different colors for my collection of New Yorker um, magazines. And so I decided to only pull from the 2020 issues as this was a time that 
you know, I know we all felt and may still feel isolated from our loved ones. And I wanted this piece um, to kind of echo happiness and share that, you know, we are all still connected and um, that we all have the ability to communicate through the arts or by letter or telephone. And um, it's a piece that's very uplifting to me. And it now hangs above my cousin's bed in her room in Michigan. Um, and I used crushed mirrors in the center with glass so that you can see yourself um, in the reflection and pieces, of course, um, if you're standing right in front of it. And it's just, I guess, my, my way of sharing a reminder to be present and encourage a smile every once in a while. Um, so I recently revisited this piece uh, as I wrote my senior thesis on Nam Gabo Pevsner, who's another Russian artist, a sculptor, um, who began studying Kandinsky's theory just prior to the distribution of his text um, concerning the spiritual in art. And they made it, they later met at the Bauhaus in Birmar, Germany. And so my research sought to analyze Gabo sculptures through the lens of Kandinsky's art historical text. Um, and I'm very happy and humbled to share that this piece is actually uh, chosen for the University Honors Program Journal, which is right here. <laughs> and I've never had any, I've never even submitted really um, things for that sort of thing. So I, I'm excited about that. So, but deciding on a name, I reflected on when I was creating it and just the last two years of following this whole trail of Kandinsky. Um, I thought about music as just a universal language as I, um, I, I grew up playing cello and um, I thought about Kandinsky's influence from Arnold Schoenberg, the Viennese composer. Um, so the title just kind of came as a natural progression. Um, but so this is my piece and I'm just so, so thrilled that everyone is here again this year and that we can continue to celebrate collage all together. So I'll pass it off to Barbara. <laughs> Am I on? <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Barbara, and I am the workshop chairperson. And I have some things planned, which I'm going to talk to Quillen about and uh, Sylvia uh, regarding the summer. Okay, it's been very difficult to find um, uh, collages where everybody could participate in, in being on Zoom. I first want to say that collage artists have done the wonder, I have met so many wonderful people and that, that have really influenced my life and been supportive. And some of you are there, Snaysha, one of them. I just, it's just been, uh, it's just been a wonderful experience for the last, I'd say probably what, 12 years. Um, I love collage, I love being expressive. And I found, uh, <laughs> I found somebody about 10 years ago, and I really, you know, I went to his workshops. His name is Robert Burridge. Um, I present, I had him present for us, um, I think it was October of last year. I got him, I couldn't believe it. And um, he's a character, but so am I, so it works out good. And I really, um, uh, he was so interesting about him, and I had never, I watched him, and I'd done collage with him, and I'd done shows and whatever, but I never, I really never tried this particular technique. So I thought I would share it with all of you. Um, what he does is he does his, he, he glues down his pieces with a medium first in black and white. And uh, interestingly enough, I have some of the pieces and I'm not trying to be dramatic, but basically, you know, he believes in ripping, you know, tearing, ripping, no scissors, which is like I don't do and just, Mainly, you can see uh, in the background, you know, these, these, you know, these pieces. I don't know. Can you see? Can you guys see? <laughs> I can't see myself. I really don't want to anyway, but this is this. And this is, you know, kind of, a, I'm just showing you. This is what he glued down first, okay? Um, I, you know, and he, and he did this particular demonstration for us, for collage. I've taken him, you know, for other workshops before, like six of them, including, uh, well, collage artist several years ago. My husband passed away, I think it was six years ago. 
And um, he said, and it really, really came to mind, you know, that if you're doing abstract, of course you can do, you know, you don't have to do abstract, but if you do abstract, he said that um, uh, it develops itself. The picture develops itself. And then you can take a paintbrush, of course, and you can, um, somebody said, I don't remember, you can make the opaque, you know, you know, little opaque pieces. So it turns into a, um, you know, a, a, a picture of something, but yet, you know, collage. You can see down here, uh, all over, you know, all over the piece is basically just pieces of paper. And then with paint, he makes, he suggests that, you know, I, I know it's not a demo, but just so you understand, you know, uh, uses one color titanium white. And, you know, if you have water, you paper towel, your finger, whatever you do, and you brush over it to get, you know, to get color, which I thought was really kind of, you know, interesting. So I started doing another one. Uh, can you see this or not? Yes. Yes. You can? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So I started trying, I'm just showing you what he does. This is all collage, this is all pieces of paper. And then of course you go over it, however you want, light, dark, uh, and it become you're using paint over the pieces, and it becomes. Um, so what I want to look for, who said? Um, it, well, it comes to life layers. The so layers kind of make it three dimensional. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a, just a little bit of what you can do, and that is really what the dancing man is. Um, use of you know ripped paper. You can see uh, a titanium white, and you can use a an acrylic. Uh, you know. Uh, I guess thinner or water uh, to do this, and um, what else? And then you put, you glue it on with you know medium that you like to use, whatever that is, and um, then you paint on top. And in, in, in light degrees, you can wipe 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 away what you don't want. Um, and uh, what else? that I want to tell you is that uh, I wrote notes here. You you come up with your own patterns. Uh, he he uh, makes his own paper. These are napkins that I bought on eBay. I have all these different ones. And um, what I wanted to do, and those of you, I'm with workshop. Uh, I would like to print something up for um, use, use for you in the summer, you know, and I'm going to try to do that because it's really been hard getting people. And um, all my little blurbs are just for fun. You can embellish them. You can do what you want. I just want to be keep you interested and excited because this group has been a, just a wonderful experience for all of us. Um, if you have any you know, questions you can ask later, I appreciate it. I appreciate your time and I'm really glad I did this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barbara. I love the demo. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elaine, you, this last but not oh, least. Right. Um, this is kind of hard to talk about because you can't see all the pages, obviously. Um, the book is called La Charette. It's hard to see that title on the little wagon. The little wagon and the little guy pulling the wagon, who's kind of a Cupid type figure, comes from an old Valentine card. Um, I get a lot of imagery from the net and my own photographs. So everything is fair game. But uh, it's interesting that somebody came up with the um, issues of copyright. So what I have done is with each book or piece that I make, I do a log and I explain where each element comes from. So I'm trying to keep myself honest. So um, I'm going to read a little bit about the charrette. Uh, does anybody know what that means, what that is? Okay, um, in 19th century France, referring to the final intense work effort, effort expended by architects to meet a project deadline at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, during the 19th century, Proctor circulated with little carts to collect final drawings and students would jump on the charrette to finish uh, to put finishing touches on their presentations minutes before the deadline. And I have where that quote comes from. So um, that's one of the themes of the book. 
um, the charrette or the little cart refers to a mystical strain of Judaism known as the Kabbalah, known as the chariot. And it's referred to in Ezekiel, so kind of esoteric. Um, I don't know if there's, let's see, um, much more that I could say about it, but I would love to. Oh, it was done on top of a pre-made book put out by Disney. With It was awful looking. It had illustrations of Cinderella's coach, and it was all about Cinderella and Prince Charming. It was just dreadful. So um, I sanded the pages and then glued stuff over it. And um, the images are, um, I left some unpainted and many painted. So if anybody has any thoughts, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. Well, I, um, we will now be moving into, this concludes our speakers. So if anyone has any thoughts for Elaine or for any of the other speakers, I will um, unshare my screen and we can, um, and we can begin to share and discuss as anyone would like. Um, there we I go. have a I question each for other. Elaine. <laughs> So I have you. a question for Elaine. Okay. Is, is that an assemblage? It's a three-dimensional piece. Uh, I composed it on the computer and then I printed it out. Okay. It layers. So I put the laminated the layers so they became dimensional, but only on the front and back covered because if I did that in the um in the body of the book, it would be like uh, coming apart. I had a heck of a time keeping that book together, by the way. <laughs> because it wanted to disintegrate. It was just on its way. Oh no. Yeah, so I used um, Tyvek to reinforce the hinges of mm. it. Really interesting. Thank you. I have a question also for Elaine. Um, did you reshape the book at all or that was the original shape? That's the original shape. It's kind of like a cloud. Uh-huh. Think about it. And since it was sort of this, uh, the theme was kind of esoteric, I thought cloud shape is, you know. Yeah. Disney is one of the most litigious mm -hmm. uh, companies around. Just This book uh, I got in a secondhand shop. Uh -huh. I don't know when, could be 20 years ago. Yeah. So who knows if they even, re well, they, you know, whatever. I don't know. They looked at high school yearbooks, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, they're got to be careful with them, but beautiful, very interesting piece. Thank you. Also, Getty images, you have to be really careful about them. Uh -huh. Oh, really? Okay. Uh-huh. Yep, know. our son actually had somebody design his website and they used Getty images and he got sued mm -hmm. and it, he got sued. Uh, well, <laughs> so. So far, I have avoided all of that. So I hope that I can avoid it. It's not that visible, you know. I mean, how many people see the thing? Mm. It was our most- Those were actual heavily. images. It wasn't a collage that he just, you know, the designer took actual images that were not altered in any way. So uh -huh. that really leaves you liable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Elaine, were um, many of most of the pages heavily collaged? Uh, I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Yes, were most of the pages heavily collaged? Uh, yeah, yeah. Got to mm -hmm. page. Many, many pages. I been. obliterated the original I, images. They're no longer. Oh. She's okay. I see. She used their book shape. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I sanded the pages to get rid of any of the finish on them, you know, so I could glue stuff down. Very cool. Has anyone actually here uh, experienced um, like a, well, I forget what it's called, but a cease and desist where the company writes to you and tells you you need to 
stop. I know Suzanne, what wound up happening with the mural? Uh, I had another photographer and somebody and his images were at Getty mm -hmm. and somebody used them, I think in Germany. And I believe Getty sued for him. Wow. And it was a cease and desist. And uh, I don't know whether he got paid for it or not. Hmm. But it, it was, uh, they do keep watch on people using their mm -hmm. images. I had another early on experience when I first started doing collage. I used Architectural Digest. And I started collaging uh, very surreal um, cutouts over defunct watercolors that I had done. Uh -huh. And I still, they're still terrific. Some of the papers coming off because I had no idea how to collage or what to use, but I still love them. I sold a few, but I still love them. I submitted them to a card company and they love them. And they said they would get back to me. They wanted, they wanted them. And they wrote me a, uh, in those days, we didn't have computers. <clears throat> and they said that um, they were so sorry, that they were very concerned that some of the images that I had used might be recognizable. And they were worried about copyright uh, issues. So they were so sorry uh, that they couldn't use my pieces. Mm. Oh, horrible. Yeah, I know of people in the paper doll world where illustrators of paper dolls who were doing um, like movie stars, paper doll movie mm -hmm. stars, and they got ceased and desist orders, but it's okay. not collage. But, you know, I, I'm sure that if you went and heavily used someone else's image of a movie star, that could be a problem. Yeah, and it tends to be, you know, a, a book about a particular movie star anyway, yes. like Marilyn Monroe's clothes or whoever. Yeah. Oh, oh abs yeah, that would be a total no. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I would. Barbie, yeah. you know. Yeah. Did you hear about the Warhol? It was the largest, uh, I would think it sold for what, 714 oh, yes. million dollars or something. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. One, yeah. But she's <laughs> so iconic. You know, years ago, um, I was using National Geographics, and mm -hmm. I, I looked up, I mean, this was a really long time ago, I had done a, a really short article on copyright issues for um, Women Painters West, mm -hmm. and I saw that a lot of people were using National Geographic more um, stealing <laughs> than in the way that I was doing it where stuff was kind of hidden so it wasn't as overt. Yeah. And um, there were whole websites of people who just came right out and said, all of my collages are made from National Geographic. So I went on National Ge Geographic and tried to find out if they said anything about using their images and what they had on there at the time was that they charged you. If you wanted to use an image, you had to pay them, I forget, $250 or something That's to be boring. able to use it. So they were making money. I, who knows if anyone ever actually paid them to do that. But the interesting thing is that um, I used to get National Geographic and I don't anymore. <laughs> but in one of their issues, they actually <laughs> have featured at the beginning um, a couple of people who used National Geographic wow. to make collages and they oh showed the collages. So here they were showing them and oh then telling you you can't unless you pay for it. So it's just really crazy out there. When, when I do my portraits, I, you know, go on the neighborhood and take pictures of people with their dogs and stuff. But when I redraw it, they don't look like that person. <laughs> But Jay Leno had a show. He's on from uh, 11 to 12. And he had a, at the beginning, he said, send me a picture of myself and, and I might, you know, put it on the show. And I did the picture and I didn't send it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, but recreating something that is, a, and I, with books, 
the new thing is you can't say different religions. You can't say what nationality, what, uh, you know, uh, and the names of restaurants. The new thing is they, they don't want you to publish anything that has anything relatable to real people or, you know, it's, it's terrible, this copywriting thing. It's not copyrighted. Well, great. I think the big thing is if you try to make money from other people's images, you know, if you do your artwork and you're going to sell it, um, I think if you're doing something as a hobby, something, you know, just for your own use where it's not displayed or it's not sold. That's a whole nother mm -hmm. um, ball of wax, so to speak. But hobby yeah, is a nasty word. What? <laughs> what? Hobby. Mm. <laughs> oh, well, I know, but I mean, if you're just doing it for your own use, I don't mean it as anybody here as a hobbyist, but just something <laughs> that you're just doing for fun. And it's not going to be sold is what I mean, you know, something that's not to be sold. Um, I, I'm in a group show, a uh, group class in Zoom and we, uh, somebody loved, you know, cause I was picking out Elvis Presley a lot because we pick out songs and someone offered me a job to make Elvis Presley an image. <laughs> and so I did. And uh, so we traded something. We never exchanged money. But, you know, my pictures don't really look, it's, you know, kind of looks like them. But anyway, but that was one way of promoting myself. Yeah. yeah. This, this is Lucy. Um, I think that the water really, it gets murky every now and then. I'm so old that when I was in. <laughs> Uh, our school at the University of Georgia, really, and I'm really old. No, they, no. They, they explained to us about copyright for paintings that if you uh, appropriate an entire landscape, just got it, there's the landscape, somebody else's, but you put a red dot on it someplace, that was enough to change the meaning of the landscape so that you could not be held liable. Now, I think that hasn't been true in a long time, but it does change, and I read a Washington Post article anticipating the um, Lynn Goldsmith versus the um, Andy Warhol Foundation uh, Supreme Court case in June 2023. And it said that anything could happen. And I think our recent Supreme Court uh, announcement that was not, you know, that was uh, by Alito, that's not actually a, an announcement yet. That makes me think anything could happen when the Supreme Court yep. looks at that case. Wow. I mean, I, first of all, it's a, it's a problem to have people who are not in any way uh, trained in art to be looking at these questions about the art. That's a problem when court looks at it. So anyway. I have a question, Hello. <laughs> Lauren, oh, okay. I don't know who I'm talking to. <laughs> just talking. Um, no, I, I just was curious. I would, my friend Nancy was talking about um, National Geographic, and um, what about the citrusol issue, where you can put citrusol, which is a chemical, on the National mm -hmm. Geographics that were printed, I think, before 1970. Um, you can get them online, and of course, the pages all kind of run. I don't know. I've used that. I, I'm just kind of curious if anyone had trouble with that before. I haven't. I've done stuff with that. And you Hi, know what? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. Can I you think see you? it's so in this. You, you have no idea where it came from. By the no. time you use it in a collage and it's all that marbly, wonderful, organic shapes, I don't think they would have, they'd be able to do it uh, to sue you for it because you can't tell where, well, Anybody in art knows it's from National Geographic because that's the only magazine that will do that. Will run, yeah. And I think even the new ones run. I have new mm -hmm. ones. My my grandson gets them. We got him a gift of it, and I said, "Give them to me afterward." They still they still run. I'll yeah. double check, but yeah, I don't think they have to be before 1970. Oh, okay. there you know what though. Later, what she said. Yesterday, we had an experimental artist group, and somebody was showing their um, mag magazine pages done by Citrusol, and some of the images were recognizable um, from the Citrusol treatment, and some were not. And I don't, I, I'm not sure what people 
would say about images that are recognizable and weren't altered that much. Pro probably don't probably. use them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or, yeah, or recognizable. Just, yeah, Brilliant. it's like, yeah, you would think. So it doesn't always totally transform, apparently. It, it's splotchy. That's interesting. It's splotchy, but I've used some in some of the print because the print gets really oh. kind of botched up, but you can still tell it's print, but you can't tell what it says. Yeah, that's so, different. Yeah, yeah, but I think when it's recognizable, don't use it. Yeah. That's why I use all my own photographs yeah. and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why I started actually doing after the card thing, taking yeah. photos of my own photographs and using them in my art. But that did not work too well when I took a photograph of that mural. <laughs> so that's the problem. No, in, in Santa Monica uh, and also ben Venice, there they do you submit some of your artwork if you want to have it made into a mural and then they send you pictures of of uh, buildings where you can choose where you want that mural and then they pay you now i was gonna do i did, I did submit something the only thing was wrong was uh and i got someone to do the mural and he was gonna take half and then they never contact me again. So, but you know, if you guys wanted your artwork on a mural, on a wall, you know, um, Venice uh, is, you know, there's a whole bunch of walls that are empty and, and uh, they, that's an avenue for someone who wants to promote their work. For the Valley now through an uh, organization called 1111, mm -hmm. um, it's called Reseda Rising and they just had Quailene would know because she's been yeah. Involved. They have murals painted all over yes. uh, the valley now. Yeah. So, but I'm reluctant. I love to see the murals and I love graffiti as well and love to take photos of that, um, those subjects. But I wasn't know. able to go to their festival because um, we had everything started, you know, kind of coming in at us that weekend. Yeah, uh, yeah. That which was sad because I would, but it was basically you visited this site and that site where they were making the murals. And I think they let the public actually help paint some of the murals. Oh, okay. Yeah. That might be. That's yeah, great. Yeah, it was definitely an event. Mm -hmm. well, I don't want to be negative about using images, but um, my sister is. Um, or is now retired, but she was a producer for commercials. And if there was a human being of any description in an image, she had to have permission from them. And nowadays with people being so litigious, and I worked in an elementary school once, and we had to have permission from the parents to use their children's images the children. on yeah. anything. So I'd be very, very careful if you have an image of somebody. And I'd I hear about somebody being in the public, but anymore, it's almost like if you're not a celebrity, are you planning on your image being used? So, I mean, I don't know, and I don't know if that's a state thing, if it's a cop, I don't, I don't know where that falls in. If you are, well, if you are photographing a person and you go up to them and ask them if it's okay, if you take mm -hmm. their photo, if you're a model, and you're photographing the model, you actually have to pay them and, right. and get an authorization. But right. there is a really good photographer, his name's Carl Schubes, and he gave a presentation uh, a couple of years ago, longer than that, because we've been. Um, and um, he said, if you are taking photos on the streets, people are walking around, your public property and you do not have to ask them for permission you can wow. use those photographs be okay mm -hmm. wow. it's probably true but it doesn't mean they can't if you're showing it somewhere and somebody sees it and they don't like the fact they can make a lot of trouble even though in the end you may not be liable yeah well, <laughs> i'm sort of talking now about yeah. putting things in a collage mm -hmm. uh, that it's doubtful that somebody is going to see it and say, oh my God, right. that's me. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Unless you're you know, if you're selling it for money, I think, does it come back to that? You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious. What I did, you know, on my block, because there's a lot of people walking their dogs now. I mean, it's all day long. So when I take my walk, so one time, you know, I was asking people if I could take a picture of them and their dog, and they allowed me to. So in front of my place, there was a lady. She had two strollers with identical, you know, twins in the stroll and two dogs. And I said, can I take a picture of She said, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, with children, yeah. it's really, really iffy. I can't yeah, that. children. Even no if way. they're strolling around. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. This is very interesting. This was great. Yeah, Lauren, you guys are all terrific. Yeah. So Lauren, much. you did a fantastic job. You did. <laughs> <Quite Lynn. laughs> Another nod to Lauren's resume. Lauren did almost all the work. I did a little no, bit. Quite oh, Lynn, you're great. Thank you all so of much you. for your help. <laughs> it's so fun to just see everyone and have a space to say hi and just hear about I learn something new from all of you every time we talk so and anytime I go to on the artist page and view all of your secret websites so not so secret websites but thank you <laughs> will we um be able to get a post of this recording yeah, so I will edit the recording so it will end when I close the slideshow so all of this conversation if that is okay with everyone um if that, does that is that good <laughs> should i cut it off at the no it's okay okay i don't mind and i will i i will also <laughs> transcribe the i will transcribe the chat again like i did last year so i'll type it all out and carol maybe hopefully and the other barbara will help us uh post it on the website um and i will i will get that done this weekend so everyone can view it again and I know um, Mike is looking forward to seeing it too so I'm happy with all the new yeah. members and yeah and we'll see you soon thank yes. you yes I'm so excited Aww. to see you soon so Lauren could I ask um for the images that you got so that I can put them <laughs> in the newsletter <laughs> I'd like to just, you know, make a little gallery in the newsletter I don't know if, if you're able though Yes, I can. I will send you the presentation and I will also do a few screen screen grabs of people in the, the gallery view if that, okay. if that works. Oh, thank you. I, I know it's a lot of work. So I was just saying, send the images. Maybe they're easier. No, I'm happy to do it. I'm just so oh, happy. Okay. This is you can make a documentary and then we'll make millions. <laughs> <laughs> Get permission from us, though. I, that's what I was going to say. I would have to write up a permission slip. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to say goodbye. Okay. Stay safe, Thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. Thank you all so much. Take care. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Stay safe. You all, too. Bye.